Good morning or good afternoon. Uh, welcome to History 384, Women in the Middle East. In the good old days when I used to teach kids in person, I always had to do this. Mm, not just to get the students to focus, but really it was a way to get them to shut up. Anyway, so here we go. Uh, what we'll do in this class is, uh, first of all, uh, look at this. No, we're not going to look at the syllabus. We'll look at the syllabus uh, towards the end. Let's just go ahead and start with the uh, beginning lecture. Now, uh, this uh, in week will be called Introduction to Patriarchy. Uh, there is no readings for this week because even though we're online, I still assume you guys are getting busy, uh, getting busy, whoops, <laughs> you guys are busy. Um, I could re-record that, but I'm too lazy. Anyway, um, you guys are busy with uh, a bunch of administrative stuff, so on and so forth. So what we'll do is we'll just have a week where I introduce you to the framework and theory of this class, uh, but uh, no readings per se. So uh, just also on another note, when this class was scheduled, it was done on the assumption that we would be meeting in a classroom. And the only time when there was a classroom in Mark Stein available for my class. It was this three hour slots, which are torture, not just for you, but for me as well. Uh, since this is now, uh, we're no longer bounded by time and space, I have teleported now into cyberspace. Uh, what I'm going to do is I will divide uh, the week's lectures into three sections. And it's not because I'm lazy or don't want to talk for three hours. That's no problem for me, <laughs> but uh, it's uh, technical. Uh, Cougar Courses doesn't like it when you upload a video longer than an hour. So I just figured let's do a three 50 minute lectures. And so just for this week, uh, just for today, let's just do 50 minutes. And then probably sometime around Wednesday, Thursday, maybe, I don't know, I'll upload the next two 50 minute lectures and we will be done for this week, okay? Assuming that you guys are busy today, let's just get a, a brief overview of the most important theories for this class. And then we will look at the syllabus and what else am I going to do? I am going to show you ahead of time. I'm going to give you the exam. Well, let's not call it an exam. Let's call it a take-home exercise, but it's, it's an exam. Midterm, yes. Two midterms, three uh, plus a final, two midterms plus a final. But I want to teach you from day one how to study for it, okay? So um, having said that, maybe some of you have just transferred here. If you do, I'm sorry, what a bad time to transfer. But uh, let's uh, show you, for you, those of you transferred, and even for those of you who are regular, uh, let's look at how to get the course material. Ooh. For those of you who are new or have just transferred everything, uh, including my lecture, you probably know would be in Cougar courses under uh, week one, but uh, you might not know how to navigate it uh, intuitively. Anyway, uh, I assume if you're watching this, you have typed in this URL that brought you to Cougar Courses. I hope you did not Google Cougar Courses because that takes you to an entirely different site. I learned that the hard way in front of class. They got this idea I was taking, Never mind. Anyway, uh, let's go to, so you'll see, uh, well, you won't see this, but you'll see. 3384. Okay. And uh, here is where we are. We are a number one introduction to patriarchy, which I'm going to talk in every, you know, 50 minute lectures. And then this will be the uh, next lecture that we'll deal with. But you might not see this here. So I want to bring your attention to the following. You want to click on course material, syllabi, textbook, and study guide. And of course, I sent you announcement to look at that to make sure everything is okay. Here you'll have your syllabus, uh, your take-home study guide, 
And this is your textbook. I've done all I can. I know a lot of you are struggling. I had a beautiful, oh, here, let me show it to you. Just hold on. Uh, you're not going anywhere. Okay, here we go. So this was the book I wanted to assign you for as a textbook, but uh, it's hardback, not out on paperback, costs a bit of money. And I've uh, really, during these tire, you know, uh, times, I, at least for my class, I didn't want you to spend any money. Okay. So what I did was, ah, if you have some surplus money, instead of buying six venti frappuccinos, I recommend buying this book. It's an excellent read. But what I did was found a textbook, actually for my former professor at UCLA. And that is what you see here, Nikki Keddie's Women in the Middle East, Past and Present. So download those, uh, download that book. And then let's actually, let's talk about the syllabus first. Let's get that over with. I don't quite the bullet, so to speak. Okay, so here's the syllabus. Now, in uh, normal times, or let's say uh, when uh, I used to actually have to print the syllabus out and I would make you actually sign it like a car rental agreement, but you know, we can't do that now. So uh, it's really important that you read through it in detail. I will just give you an overview of the various parts and it's now with the going online, it's gone into nine pages. When I was an undergrad, a syllabus used to be a single page. Nine pages, okay. Longer than an iTunes agreement. But anyway, so here's our class. There is the catalog description, boring. Here's my description, very saucy and spicy. Okay, so what we're gonna do is study uh, the history of gender in the Middle East from the beginning, from Adam and Eve to COVID-19 and how that's affected women in the Middle East, all right? Uh, so broad time span and look what I underlined here. You need no background of the Middle, of Middle East history for this class. I, mean, I assume you know nothing. Well, I, I assume you know something, but I, <laughs> I assume you know nothing. Well, no, no, I mean, I assume you know nothing about the Middle East. That's, that's just the best way to do it. Maybe some of you do know something about the Middle East. Maybe some of you are from the Middle East. I, I haven't looked at the roster yet. Anyway, so everything, like I said, would be delivered to Google Courses. And every PowerPoint I show will be uploaded, as well as you will download the textbook. Okay. And that's it. If you could navigate this much technologically, in other words, if you got to this lecture, you have all the technological competence. And if you have any questions, here is uh, the tech office. Okay. Course learning outcomes is basically stuff you hopefully you will learn. Read that on your own. This is what we expect you to learn in the Department of History. Okay, so like I said, in the beginning, uh, the textbook is Nikki Keddie's. Women in the Middle East, past and present. And then when we get to the individual national studies, in other words, when we study specific nations, I will assign you a chapter about the status of women in every single one of you of those countries from this institute known as Freedom House. Okay? And I'm gonna upload that to you, don't worry. Now, every week you'll be assigned a primary and secondary source. And what's the difference? Well, you read about it on your own, but basically, very simply, a primary source is produced from the exact era that we're studying. A secondary source is produced by somebody who was not a witness to that period. Well, usually secondary sources are produced in the present, about the past. And just familiarize yourself with these questions or what are the differences. Okay. And then here we are on the schedule. Let me see here. Where do I know? Okay, so we're going to look at what is patriarchy. And what is patriarchy? Well, I'm going to define that for you. But patriarchy is going to be the overarching, one of the overarching themes and theories uh, throughout this course. Okay. Part one, we'll look at women in the pre-modern Middle East. That's what I'm saying, Adam and Eve, or more accurately, uh, we'll begin with the Sumerians, the, the ancient Mesopotamian civilization. Okay. 
uh, notice next week uh, is Labor Day, so technically. <laughs> Yeah, you have that entire week off because technically I guess it's three hours. Yeah, so I have to give you that entire week off. Uh, so then um, we, I guess we meet back at week three and we'll begin with gender in the pre-Islamic Middle East. And then notice from week three onwards, the primary and secondary sources will be uploaded for each lecture from this point onwards. Okay, so you'll have a uh, you know, this much reading from the Kedi book and assume primary and secondary sources will be uploaded. Okay. So what do we mean by the pre-modern Middle East? Again, I have to explain that to you, what we're gonna do in this lecture. Part two then is on women and the Middle East in the modern era. Okay. And then notice what we have here in week six on Monday, October 9th. In other words, after you're going to watch three lectures, three 50-minute lectures that would be uploaded on that day, you're going to have a take-home exercise. You'll have your first midterm. And what will that look like? Well, we'll show you once the syllabus is done. Then Orientalism and Gender, Princess Lady Leia to Lady Gaga. That's a fun one. Then we start studying individual countries, Afghanistan, Turkey, Iran. And then you'll notice in week 10, we'll have another take-home exercise. And that will be on Monday, November 2nd. And then after week 10, the next part of the course, we study the modern Middle East, but Arab countries. Okay. And that's every take-home exercise is pretty much ending at a juncture. So when we end on week six, that's right before on the eve of the 20th century. Week 10, we will deal with, you'll just be examined, you'll be quizzed, not quizzed, examined on Afghanistan, Turkey, and Iran, three non-Arab countries. Then we'll do Egypt, Lebanon, Saudi Arabia, and the Gulf. I have to get the readings for that, so give me some time. That's a tricky, uh, those are a tricky set of readings to get, that, that's why. It's, uh, anyway, then we'll look at women in Palestine, Israel, and Syria, women in Iraq and ISIS, and then finally, uh, oh shoot, I really screwed up on week 15. <laughs> Middle Eastern women in the US, not ISIS. That's already in week 14, that confused me. And I haven't been given our, when is our final exam time slot? Maybe you have, I have it. And if you know when the final exam is scheduled, uh, let me know, that'd be great. Then we have, how am I going to evaluate you? Well, uh, so this is what I've done. I've tried to uh, balance the class. Uh, first take home exercise, 25%. Second take home exercise, another 25%. And then the final take home exercise, 50%. And what is it? You'll have 24 hours to complete a take home assignment. The same on November 2nd. And then when your final is, you're given 48 hours. Okay, this is a lot of bureaucracy stuff, bureaucratic stuff I have to write. Okay, office hours. Uh, why don't you, ah, let me log into Skype actually. Technically I was supposed to be in office hours today and I forgot. Oh well, anyway, um, yes, yeah, so I will, I'll always just be on Skype as a, just a rule. So you always, if you have a question, you could just uh, send me a message if you want to meet formally. Uh, what else? Yeah, I didn't think about this. Where are we? Okay. Also, um, let me think about this. Uh, so you could contact me on Skype. Uh, here's another thing if you're interested in. Um, uh, this is what I do. Last year I was teaching in uh, Spain and uh, then the quarantine happened and I had to come to the US and it was a pain. Uh, you feel free to follow me on Instagram. Uh, it's the same as Skype, just I'm the only Ibrahim al Marashi on it. And you know, I have a lot of fun, interesting historical images. Uh, if uh, that's another way and um, uh, make sure you're okay with me following you back. And that's another way to communicate. So what I did with the students in Spain was we just did Instagram chats.
Uh, and actually, here, you want to know an interesting story of how Instagram saved a student's life. Not saved, I mean, not literally. But um, here's an interesting story. Um, uh, yeah, uh, one of my students in Spain, of course, they had a take-home final, and I didn't get it from one of my students to my uh, work account. And I had, I just noticed this with an hour to turn in the grades by the deadline. And I sent him an email. Of course, there was a time difference. He was back in Italy. I was in California. And I was like, oh, shoot, I'm going to give this, I'm going to fail this guy. And uh, he didn't seem like a guy not to turn in an assignment. And sure enough, what I just do, I just called him on Instagram chats, woke him up, and I said, where's your assignment? And he goes, I sent it. And so what we were doing on Instagram, I was like, send it again, send it again. And it didn't go through. Then I said, okay, send it to my personal email. And it went through. And I had 30 minutes to grade it, which was enough time. But you know the reason why I wasn't going through my work email? His name is Massimo. Maximo in Italian. Uh, what is in English? Massimo. Okay. And what does Massimo have? The word A-S-S -S in it. And I think my stupid university in Spain put this kind of filter. Uh, so that's why his, I never got his take-home exam. But that's how Instagram saves life, or at least the student grade. Okay, that was completely... Uh, a <laughs> distraction talking about Instagram? Yeah, but feel free to add me. Okay, the you writing a crime assignment, we're doing that. Plagiarism, ADA statement, credit hours. That don't turn in stuff late, read this, and I might change. Well, definitely I will change the syllabus as we proceed. Okay, so hopefully, uh, let me stop scrolling and that will be a self-explanatory. I am gonna go over the take-home study guide. And then I'm gonna go over it again, because uh, let me just introduce it to you, just like throwing a baby into the water and hope it swims. And then, um, <laughs> I don't know where I'm getting my metaphors from. Uh, it's no different in class. I, I come up with these stupid metaphors. Anyway, and then what we'll do is um, we'll begin, and hopefully the study guide will make sense, but let's uh, pull that up. Okay. Okay. So uh, this is the first. Uh, well, you have the dates, and you know what you're responsible for. Um, well, I'll tell you what you're responsible for. I'm not. I didn't mean that. I'm not, I'll tell you what you're responsible for. You know, close to the exam time. But what you'll have is on every exam. So there's no shocks, no surprises. Is uh, so from the readings you have, one is a secondary source, and usually that's an article, right? And that will always be worth 25 points. So there's no surprises. You know, I try to be as kind of transparent so you know. Uh, okay. And now you'll probably even, this question is not going to make sense, but what are the manifestations of pre-modernity and modernity in this article? Now, this, these are just the most important excerpts that I would, I would want you to look at. Now, this is take home, so you, you have the luxury of going home and looking at the readings, right? This is an, uh, this is, uh, an exam not based on memorization. Uh, this is really, I'm grading you and how you analyze and think through this. Okay. So by the time you get the first midterm, you should be thinking about what is pre-modernity and modernity. You've probably heard these words before, but I'm going to give you a framework, a kind of theory to understand it. Then you'd be asked this. Okay, and so that would be worth 15 points. Ah, okay, so this is the most important. Remember, always, if it's 15 points, uh, just try to imagine, let's say, four to five sentences. Just try to imagine around 2.53 sentences would be really always a good strategy, okay? And here, what are the most dominant, prominent, and influential levels of patriarchy referred to in this article? Again, this, is, this question is not gonna make sense to you. I'm, I'm just showing you this so you pay particular attention when I go over this in the lecture, okay? Uh, patriarchy of the state, and one we could say is societal patriarchy. And read this on your own as well. Then, of course, being a history class, the most important part of this class are primary documents. The records left from the past. Okay. 
interesting. Now look at this. What is a primary document? Again, you would have read this. You would have read this before the exam, but you would have two excerpts, right? One from 636, one from the year 655, okay? And you would be asked to compare uh, who is in each document, okay? Uh, who is, uh, now tech, I already caught a mistake here. Compare who produces these documents? No, what I would ask probably in this question is, compare the two women referred to in this document. Okay. I'm just gonna make a note of that and I'll fix it. And that's brief, it's only five points. Compare the two women referred to this article. Okay. Then, uh, and that, that's going to be the question you're going to get regardless. And then the second question would be compare the historical context, what was happening. Okay. And then you tell me who would have been the audiences in the first and second documents. Okay. And you said, these are things you're going to have to really think about. Okay. Uh, so you have a lot of background information with the primary documents. And we'll talk about that in class, okay? I mean, in theory, every single one of the things I'm gonna ask you on the exam, you will have the uh, more or less background or way to think about it in class. But uh, of course, some of it is also gonna require some uh, you know, independent thinking, yeah? And then you'd be asked, why are these documents significant for world history? Okay. And that'll be 10 points, so you know, if you write two, Think about a two very strong sentences that are worth five points each. That's good. Then, this gets the, uh, to the important part. Uh, what aspect of the pre-modern and modern are in both documents? Okay. And then finally, like the previous one, you'll be asked what levels of patriarchy do we see in both passages? Keep in mind, some passages might be tricky. You might not see any patriarchy. Okay. And then you'll have an image two images that you have to compare. And there'll be images that we would have discussed in class. Okay. And of course, if there are images that would be uh, potentially on the take home exam, th these images would have information underneath the PowerPoint slide. Okay. So that's where you would get the information for every image, not just me speaking about it, but all the re relevant information, you go back to the lecture. And again, I will ask, uh, why are these, uh, now this is just a shorter section, 30, because this is not an art history class. Why are these paintings significant for world history? And what are the pre-modern and modern aspects? What levels of patriarchy do we see there? So 10, 10, 10, 10, we do the math right for 30 points. Okay, so that's uh, kind of getting the admin out of the way. So let's actually, so we have 20 minutes left. Let's actually begin uh, with, we'll get just a little bit into this lecture and we'll find kind of an appropriate place to uh, pause. Okay. So this is a lecture called Introduction to Patriarchy. And why is a lecture like this significant is, this hopefully is intuitive. This is all I'm asking you to do is, uh, based on this lecture, kind of look at the world around you in a different way afterwards, okay? And I will show you kind of what levels of patriarchy I expect you to kind of internalize and understand. But today we're gonna look at patriarchy of religion and maybe get to patriarchy of the state. So, first of all, why is your topic unique? You're not just studying a class on women in the Middle East. You're studying a class on women in the Middle East in a post 9-11 era. Okay. And I mean, it's quite interesting because you've lived through, you are living through, but you've also experienced two transformative events. Okay. Now, a good number of you were probably kids on 9-11. Maybe a good number of you uh, fought in Afghanistan 
after 9-11. Uh, that's the kind of interesting dichotomies we've had in our classes. Uh, in the past, I've had a good number of veterans from the war in Afghanistan. Okay, but uh, when we look at something like this, the myth of the 72 virgins in Islam, that is a myth informed by our post 9-11 era. Okay. In other words, you might study gender in Latin America, Sub-Saharan Africa, Asia, Europe, uh, so on and so forth, which would be all wonderful classes. I'm not sure they're offered, but this subject is quite different because this is not just a class on women in the Middle East. This is a class on a subject that has particular relevance and sensitivity after 9-11. Uh, just to give you one example, think of what the image of a veiled woman communicates pre-9-11 and post-9-11. And there you go why this subject is particularly unique when we look at the history of gender. So having said that, what do I mean by patriarchy? And if you look at this um, uh, kind of very uh, kind of pivotal book in the study of gender, the creation of patriarchy, what can we get? Uh, they say you can't judge a book by its cover. No, of course you can judge a book by its cover. Uh, look what is right there. The, the, those are reliefs from ancient Mesopotamia. In other words, what is Gerda Lerner saying? That patriarchy was something that was created. And this is what I'm going to go through. And where did it begin? In the Middle East. Okay. So not only is studying gender in the Middle East important because it has post 9-11 relevance, okay? but it's also the kind of birthplace of a lot of the traditions and gendered values that we carry in the present because out of the Middle East, those values would influence Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. The three Abrahamic religions that are the majority of faiths practiced in the world today. So what is patriarchy in then? Well, let's break it down. Uh, look at the Greek. Uh, so patriarchy is a Greek word. And archi in Greek, means any kind of rule, okay? So if I take the Greek word for one, mono, and put mono, archi, monarchy, okay? That means one person is ruling, right? If you have, uh, let's say, a, uh, give you another example. So that's a monarchy. Uh, a few in Greek is lire. Okay, so if I put oligarchy or an oligarchy, okay, that's a rule of just a few people. Here's an interesting. <laughs> okay, so what about this? Why don't we take the word archi and put it in front of the word tech or tecton in Greek? Okay, so if archi is a ruler, what are tectons? Tectons are pieces just like in the, play, in the word tectonic plate. The world is divided into tectonic plates. And when they bump up against each other, they cause an earthquake, tectonic plates. The Greek word for uh, plates or pieces of things is tecton, okay? So what if you are the master of an architecton? Okay. In other words, the master of putting things, pieces together, what are you? You're an architect. That's where the word architect comes from. And here is just another in the psh, uh, theme. Uh, what did Jesus do for a living? He's not a carpenter. Nowhere in the Bible. Keep in mind, the life of Jesus was written in the Bible, New Testament in Greek. Um, he wasn't a carpenter. And think about the, where he lived. There weren't that many trees around to have the luxury of being an architect, uh, a carpenter. In uh, the Greek of the Bible, Jesus was a tecton. He was somebody good at putting things together. What we would translate it as a handyman. Okay, both Jesus and uh, Joseph would have been tecton. Okay. So having said that then, now you know what an archi is. What is then literally the word patriarchy? Uh, the, the rule of the father. Now it doesn't literally mean that. Okay. Patriarchy is uh, become now, that's what it literally means. But in, when we use it in this kind of, sense of a 
theory, we're talking about a system where all fathers, or in other words, men, a system where men's role is dominant politically, socially, economically. And basically what is Gerda Lerner's uh, book about, how did this system emerge? And I'm not gonna sign the book, I'm gonna tell you the book. I mean, that's the whole uh, beginning of this course. Right? Okay, then what's the other point of this course? Okay, so let's look at uh, Mr. Schrute. There's women's studies, but no women's studies. And what does Dwight say? False. Men's studies is called history. Okay. So what is the point of this lecture is trying to put women back into history. Not just Middle Eastern history. We're going to see in the beginning I have to set up this class. I'm going to go over basically women's history to get you to understand the history of women in the Middle East. I have to make you understand the history of women ever so briefly in Europe and the US as well. So men's studies is called history. So how do we make history be a study of both men and women or essentially a gendered history? Okay. So look at the word I just used, gendered. And we're gonna look at our first video, the feminist theory of Simone de Beauvoir. So let us watch this video. And instead of trying to explain the theory, let me have this video do the work for me. Okay. Oh shoot, now we have to watch the end. Come on.
Okay. And uh, basically, the Beauvoir, uh, the Beauvoir's uh, theory will be explained, uh, will be made uh, kind of uh, concrete as this class proceeds. But what amazes me about professors is how we take very simple terms and or intellectuals in this case, and make the most complex terms. The dialectical process of social construction. Really it's an easy way to define a man, he compares himself to a woman. And basically it's a negative comparison. That's basically it, okay. Gender is constructed through the act of comparison. Gendered is the binary opposition of man versus woman. To define a man, you are not a woman. What does that mean? We are always comparing. And I'll, this will be clear to you as we proceed, okay? But uh, this is the kind of, you know, the brilliant, uh, De Beauvoir was uh, kind of the pioneer in thinking about, of developing what is a feminist theory. Okay? Feminism as a movement existed, but femin and you have to see there, there are two different things. Okay? Feminist theory, okay. It's just basically asking you, it's not feminism as in joining a feminist movement, it is to waken up, to wake up to how the difference between men and women are constructed in society. In other words, gender. Okay, so what is gender? Well, here's a good example. These two children haven't realized it yet. Okay, so I'll just translate this. Our configurations are different. The girl says, yes, you have a Wi-Fi antenna and I have a uh, CD player or CD reader, right? And in other words, what these two, the boy and girl are realizing is what's the difference between them? It's already they're waking up to the biological difference. Okay, now biological difference is just that, it's scientific. Now, as these two kids grew up, when the girl is told a princess like you should wear a pink dress, or this boy is told he can't play with a Barbie doll, okay, those are going to be the gendered constructions that they're gonna grow up with, or the gendered roles that they're gonna be socialized into. Okay. So, that's now I've explained uh, kind of patriarchy. When I mean gender, what do I mean by gender? Now, the next is a grand theory of the kind of history of the world. Okay. But, it's grand history of the world where feminism plays a role in it, okay? So, let's see, first of all, how much time I have. Oh, okay, I have a good seven minutes. So, when we mean modernity, modernity is usually when places in the world started to achieve a condition of mass. Okay. Plus with the emergence, and this is the important part, with the ideologies that usually end in an ism, right? So if I begin with, uh, when do we say early modernity began? Well, when colonialism began. Okay. Because what was, uh, uh, well, first of all, think about this. Well, I mean, you probably use these ways to refer to modernity in the everyday life and you never really picked up on it, okay? Uh, think about this, mass media. Some of you study mass media studies. To have a mass media is a modern media system. Okay. Uh, what else? Mass transportation. Okay, when we talk about the bus, so on and so forth, that's moving the masses. If a country has a mass transportation system, it's considered modern. Uh, weapons of mass destruction are modern weapons, for example. Uh, mass consumption, mass production, all of these are modern concepts, okay? So really, I mean, all we're studying, I mean, what's important is the number nine in this class. Okay? But I'll just give you um, kind of just very briefly overviews of uh, colonialism, okay? 
Uh, colonialism, just think about this. When did colonialism begin? When Christopher Columbus uh, sailed from Spain and landed, landed in Central America. Now, technically, he was not the first European to land in the Americas. Vikings preceded him. Okay. But you see, after the Vikings, there was no mass. In that. See, the Vikings crossed mass distances, but there was no mass inhabitation of North America as a result of the Vikings coming to what is Newfoundland. Okay. What Columbus instituted was a mass movement of people from Spain to Central America, with the same time the mass elimination of the native populations of Central and South America, as well as North America. Because what did he mass transport? Diseases in the boats with him, right? What is a Latino? Or Latinx, I should say, gotta learn that. Uh, Latinx is a modern person, okay? Before 1492, no European and no Native American had ever married and had kids. There was no mestizos. Okay? Mestizos are a modern group of people. What is uh, Protestant, no, no, let's just skip that, capitalism. Uh, like I said, the minute you had the factory that could mass produce and a middle class that could mass consume. And notice a lot of these isms end with the word is. Okay. What is nationalism? Nationalism is just the modern idea that there's a mass of people who speak the same language, you now belong to a nation. The mass of people who speak the German language belong to nothing new called the German nation. The mass of people who swear allegiance to the American Constitution are now part of a nation called the United States of America. Okay. Let's skip all of those. What is feminism? Now, I show all of those. Let's say anarchism. What is anarchism? The masses should revolt against the state. Feminism is basically an argument that the mass of the world that constitutes 50% of the population doesn't have the right to participate in mass democracy, or in other words, vote. And that is the birth of feminism. In other words, feminism is a modern movement, okay? And some feminists could be also anarchists. Some feminists were socialist Marxists, and you did have feminist fascists. What is fascism that makes it modern or socialism that makes it modern? Socialism basically says mass production should be controlled by the state. Capitalism says mass production should be allowed to operate according to the invisible hand of the market without state interference. Fascism says that the market should be controlled by the state as well as is an ultra form of nationalism. And fascism is also opposed very much to number eight, socialism, Marxism, communism. Everything else, of course, you have feminist environmentalists and all of those are not important for this class. I just wanted to show you what, what makes feminism modern. Okay. So always remember, modernity is about that condition of mass. And what we're going to be studying in this course is the history of feminist movements in the Middle East. But the important thing to realize is the feminist movement in the Middle East was a modern movement. Now, when did I say modernity began? Well, okay, we can start with Columbus. Mass transportation, mass movement of people. We see modernity is a condition that started in different places in the world at different times. Now, which that remains us then. What is pre-modernity? It's simply the condition that existed before modernity. What are pre-modern? What is pre-modern? Most of our religions are pre-modern. Christianity, Judaism, Islam all began before the modern era. Protestantism, however, is a modern offshoot of Christianity because what was the key to Protestantism? the mass production of Martin Luther's pamphlets and Bibles that people could read in their own language. And what did you need for both of those? A printing press to mass produce that, right? And the thing about modernity is this. We live in a, pre -modern, we live in a modern era, but we still have a lot of pre-modernity with us. If we're practicing, a, uh, uh, then 
practicing Christianity, we're practicing a pre-modern faith in the modern era. We still belong to families. Families are pre-modern social units. At the same time, we belong to nations. And what is a nation? Just a huge extended version of your family. Think even we call nations the fatherland, the motherland, right? So that's the important thing to know, is to analyze what is pre-modern in our life, what is modern in our life. And what you're going to also have to see is the evolution of women in the Middle East, from the pre-modern to the modern. Okay, so why don't I end here, and we'll have kind of, this is the end of the first section. The next section will then deal, I'll probably upload that maybe tomorrow or Wednesday, will deal with uh, patriarchy of religion and then maybe patriarchy of the state. Okay, so if you have questions, you know where the forum is. I already sent you a forum uh, thingy. And um, email me or, uh, yeah, follow me on the, the social medias, social media, and we'll keep in touch. All right, good luck, everyone. Stay, stay safe, and let's class adjourn.